3D printing for the post-COVID world. This evening, we will get to have the opportunity to delve into the wonderful world of 3D printing. We're going to look at the expectations, the hopes, as well as the possibilities in a post-COVID world. Great to have you all with us here tonight. And before we begin, however, I'd like to go over some housekeeping and netiquette rules. As you just heard, this event will be recorded tonight. We will ask you to please uh, keep yourself muted and also uh, keep your camera off unless you're actually stepping onto our virtual stage. And um, this uh, video, which will, uh, of course, will be recorded, will be available on the YouTube channel of the Institute for Technology Assessment and System Analysis very soon. So if you want to watch it at a later date, you are more than invited to do so. Now, this evening is uh, not just going to be about um, Frontalunterricht, as we say in German, but we want to actively engage with our audience tonight. And we'll let you know how you can do that just a little bit later in our q and a session. Before we begin, I would like to take the time to introduce myself to you too. My name is Kinsey von Reischach. I'm a freelance presenter, host, and moderator. I work for German as well as international companies. I work for state and federal ministries uh, on stage or streaming from home as I am doing uh, today. And I really have the fantastic job. I get to dive into different subjects and topics every week. It could be um, that I talk about hydrogen and the possibilities of being the green energy source of the future, or I talk about the, um, the education system in Baden-Württemberg, or as tonight, I have the chance to talk with you and our fantastic panel about the wonderful world of 3D printing. So um, tonight, we all really have the chance to engage with leading scientists and a fantastic and stellar panel and exchange ideas, knowledge, and also visions on 3D printing. Now, this public event this evening is not a standalone event. It is a part of a small part of a two-day international symposium, a research symposium. And that symposium is called uh, Reimagining the Futures of 3D Printing in Society. It is sponsored by the Hector Fellow Academy and it is part of the project vision assessment of scalable 3D printing in the cluster of excellence 3D matter made to order of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT and Heidelberg University. Now, that was a lot of information, the cluster, the symposium, and also the project. So before we go to tonight's topic and 3D printing, let's talk about those three things briefly. So I would like to ask onto our virtual stage now, three gentlemen who know a lot about these subjects. So please welcome from KIT, specifically from the Institute for Technology Assessment and System Analysis, Dr. Andreas Lesch, Group Leader for the Research Group Socio-Technical Futures and Policies. Hi, Andreas, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. And you, Kimsey? Very good, very good. <laughs> From ITAS, short, please also welcome the member of staff in the Project Vision Assessment and PhD candidate, Max Rossmann. Hey, Max. Hi, nice to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, lastly, also from ETAS and a member of staff in the Project Vision Assessment, who has been extremely busy, not just in the past couple of weeks, but I can imagine in the past couple of months, in organizing and also executing this fantastic two-day symposium, which is wrapped around our event this evening. Please welcome Dr. Schneider. We hearing somebody else who is not on the stage. Okay, not anymore. Hey, Christo, how are uh, you? Hey, I'm good, yeah. One day already successful. One down, one to go. We're gonna talk about the symposium with you uh, just in a minute, but I think I'll start at the beginning. And Andreas, I think I would like to begin with you. So I mentioned uh, the cluster 3D Matter made to order. Can you tell us what this cluster is? What do you guys do? Okay, um, this cluster, is a joint research cluster, as you uh, already mentioned, between uh, several institutes from the KIT and the Heidelberg University. And uh, this cluster started in uh, 2019, January. And here in this cluster, around 100 scientists coming from 
physics, chemistry, biology, electrical, me mechanical engineering are working together to bring 3D printing to the next level of scalable 3D additive manufacturing driven towards a molecular scale. That is, they, they are conducting a lot of different research and driven by um, some visionary applications. And the most prominent here is to um, print scaffolds for cell culture, aiming at reconstructing the functioning, functioning human retina. This is one approach. But my institute, the Institute for Technology Assessment, has the role in this cluster of a kind of an accompanying social science study to assess the society, more the societal impacts of this research, the research, the physicists, chemist, chemistry, and people from biology uh, are doing. Okay. And is there a time limit on how long your cluster of excellence will be active? The cluster of excellence is now um, the cluster of excellence is now funded um, for seven years. Maybe it will get more. Don't know. But uh, our study is running for um, for about three years. So we started also mid we started mid um, uh, 2090 will and will end our job uh, our study in uh, 2022. Now. As mentioned just a little bit earlier, um, you said it, um, what the cluster does is to take 3D printing to the next level. So as a, as a non-scientist, um, can, <laughs> when did you, when have you reached that next level? Like what's the parameter for this? I do not do this and the cluster research is doing this, but uh, I would say they are already on the next level of uh, 3D printing. But of course, they have not reached all their visionary goals, and they, uh, but they will uh, get a lot of uh, research results and applications, which are very different and have a next level compared to traditional or industrial 3D printing, which we have had before or had before. Yeah. Great, thank you very much, Andreas. Max, I'll, uh, I'll move to you. And I would uh, like to talk uh, with and to you about the project vision assessment and mm -hmm. how it is attached to the cluster. What can you tell us about that? So in general, vision assessment is kind of a response of technology assessment to the realization that visions of the future have actually already a major impact on technology development. So point is we do not aim to predict the future, but we want to reveal which promissory stories drive the present technology development. And such visions are very powerful because they show how we might overcome the present challenges such as housing inequality or yeah, the decentralized production of the present, in the present corona crisis of spare parts and ventilators. And yeah, in our re integrated research, we would like and observe those often subconscious processes of visions to initiate reflection on them to make better futures and to reveal how those mechanisms drive technology development. Now, I read that there's also a time limit um, on this project, or it runs for a specific time from 2019 until 2022. So you still have one year to go. What would you say? Where are you now and where do you aim to be next year? So, well, one goal is definitely to better understand the multitude of 3D printing visions and their spread and their underlying motivations for different audiences. But however, unlike the historical sciences, technology assessment is also about revealing and reflecting alternative futures for the present. So yeah, with our project, we want to foster the reflection on the boundaries of the visions and to contribute to 3D printing vision to driving us to a more inclusive and sustainable future. Great, Max, thank you very much. Futures is, uh, in fact, I'd say a perfect keyword uh, that shall take me to Christoph. Um, now, Christoph, let's talk about the symposium um, in general for a minute. And uh, you were so kind as to brief me um, and answer all my millions of questions that I had for tonight's uh, event. But one main question I had in regards to the symposium was the title. Um, because to me, the, the title didn't totally make sense or it made sense, but I didn't fully understand it. I asked you the question and I think that might be a question that could be interesting to our audience and our viewers out there.
why is your symposium called reimagining the futures of 3D printing for our society? So why is it not just called imagining the future of 3D printing? Why are you reimagining? Uh, and how can there be more than one future? How can there be multiple futures? Mm -hmm. Yeah, big question, Kimsey. Let me try to unpack that. Um, why do we want to reimagine these futures? Well, basically, 3D printing visions, stories about how 3D printing could change the world, they have been around for quite some time now. 3D printing is an industrial use uh, since the 1980s. Since the 2000s, we had this uh, the spread of uh, 3D printing through online communities and, and, and other aspects. And we also, we, we still have, actually, we found out that we often have, the, the stories are not, sometimes not yet really up to date, some of the stories. Some are, they are kind of being told again and again for, for a lot of long time now. And so we, we bring together leading researchers from across the globe, actually in the symposium to take stock of the, the, the past of 3D printing, to look at what was actually, which promises were fulfilled, which are not yet fulfilled, which may never be fulfilled. And then to take this uh, discussion forward also to look at, okay, so how might, may we need to adapt our imagination of 3D printing? Is it maybe necessary to, to tell different stories now for the for the 2020s? Um, and these stories that we tell about our future, we call them futures because there are many ways how we can actually imagine our future. And this makes a great difference how we imagine the future now is a very influential aspect in how we shape it. And therefore, we have different options in shaping our future. And um, yeah, during the symposium, therefore, we don't want to predict what will be in, in 10 years or so, because in a way, that's too easy. Every business magazine can do that. We let them do that. No, it's not easy. Basically, it's, it's not, uh, not, not working. So, but we, we want to work on what different scenarios we can think of today to make them useful for us today in shaping our, our pathways into the future in a way. It seemed like a very powerful sentence for you to say, because in fact, it felt to me when you said it to me the first time, it's like, you're manifesting your future. You know, you're you're not just you're not putting it out there into somebody else's hand or into fate's hand, but you're actually you're manifesting it right here and there and thereby laying the path for your future. Also, I thought that was quite um, interesting. Yeah, I think that's a key aspect of our work as well in, in the symposium and in at our institute. That in a way we want you to, to to reclaim the future, reclaim it from technology, or reclaim it from in a way, uh, whoever does it and, and, and show that it's actually, you know, it's we as a society who make the decision. And so that we hope that this can also help us and empower us to shape futures. And therefore we have this symposium and uh, yeah, we, we are in the midst of, of reshaping the discussion in a way. So the discussions in the symposium, uh, they lasted all day today. Can you tell the viewers that weren't as lucky as I um, to jump behind the scenes and witness a couple of the keynotes today? Um, can you tell our viewers what happened today? Yeah, um, around uh, 50 researchers from across the globe met virtually. Um, and we had people from Malaysia, the US, Europe, um, coming together to discuss in different forms. Um, we had keynotes, we had a lot of discussions. We also use a, a digital platform that enables everyone to share their knowledge because sometimes video calls are just uh, not, don't provide enough space for all the necessary discussions and conversations, yeah. Did anything happen that you were surprised about? 
Yeah, I was surprised and uh, really happy about an encounter that I was part of. Um, it was in a small Zoom breakout room where a researcher from Malaysia met a researcher from Germany and they discussed the role of 3D printing for small and medium sized enterprises in their country. And they found out that they actually had basically the similar problems. And for them, it was really revealing to see how uh, in such a different context, challenges can be quite similar. Wow. And so what's your outlook briefly for tomorrow? What do you expect to happen tomorrow? What is planned? What is planned? Uh, we will have another day of um, sessions, our workshops, interactive workshops. Uh, we will have artists who do live 3D printing art um, and they react to what is discussed during the symposium. So I'm really curious how this will, the artwork will look to the, uh, tomorrow. And they're, they're creating art while listening to all of you? Or how exactly. does that? Yeah, yeah. So they, they work in the background and they take ideas uh, or words or images from the discussion and modulate them in, in a 3D design program and make art out of that, yeah. Wow, fantastic. Okay, so I would like to thank you very much, Christoph, uh, for the chance to get to talk to you, uh, but also, of course, for organizing the symposium. And I would also like to thank Andreas and Max for answering my questions. And with that, I would say, let's move on to the next segment. Now, I said already, we really want you to interact um, or we want to interact with you, dear audience members uh, tonight. And uh, we have prepared a little survey and I'll ask uh, Simon or Lily to please trigger it now. So of course, we're talking about 3D printing tonight. And of course, we're talking about post Corona, post uh, the pandemic. So we would like to know from you all, what would you do with 3D printing after the Corona pandemic. So guys, we'd like to know from you, what would you do? Would you print money? Would you print face shields for the next pandemic? Would you publicly fund organizations that make 3D printing accessible? Would you fund startups that use 3D printing? Or would you think about the requirements of systemic transformations of our economy and how 3D printing could fit in there? So let's see, oh, very good. A lot of you are using the last answer. Um, we did a little test run before earlier and uh, a lot of the test people who shall remain nameless now said they print money. Um, but here it is in fact that our audience, 49%, okay, the largest part of our audience uh, would use 3D printing for systemic transformations of our economy. So um, that's fantastic because that's, of course, what we're going to talk about next in our panel discussion. We're going to talk about the possibilities. What can 3D printing do for our society post-corona? And of course, here's the good news already because we're talking post-corona and post-pandemic, which of course means that this pandemic at some point hopefully very, very soon will be over. Okay, so 51% has the last point thinking about the systemic transformations. Now, with that, we're, we can discuss this result in just a moment with our panel. I would like to introduce my panel or our panel to you, dear audience members. It is, um, it is a fantastic panel that I get to introduce now. And the difficult part here was to just cherry pick a couple of the highlights uh, when introducing this panel so that my introduction doesn't go for an hour and a half. So I, I tried my best, um, but here goes. I would like to begin with Dr. Carla Alvival Palavicinha. Carla is a interdisciplinary researcher working on innovation policy, future studies, and socio-technical transformation. She is trained as a molecular science biologist. Sorry, she has a master's on sustainability from the University of Tokyo, and she has a PhD on governments of innovation from the University of Twente. She works at the Center for Global Challenges in Utrecht University, where she is a research fellow for transformative innovation policy. Hi, Carla. Welcome. Hi. Glad to be here. I would also like to welcome Dr. Angela Daly. 
Angela is joining us from Glasgow tonight, where I hear the weather has been fantastic the last couple of days. I've been doing a little bit of Twitter stalking, I have to admit. Angela is the new-ish uh, director of the Research Center and the fully online master's degree on internet law at the Strathclyde Center for Internet Law and Policy. She's been abroad for many years. She spent some time at Stanford. She was in Australia. She has uh, spent time in Hong Kong before returning home to her native Glasgow. She holds a PhD in, uh, from the European University Institute in Italy and, and his PhD is in law. She has written three books Books, one of which is called Socio-Legal Aspects of the 3D Printing Revolution. We'll talk about that a little bit later on tonight. Hi, Angela. Hi there. Thanks for having me. And uh, we are super pleased to have the entire uh, Gershenfeld family, all three brothers, with us tonight. Uh, so I'm going to move down the Gershenfeld um, alphabet, starting with A, like Alan. Alan Gershenfeld is co-founder and president of E-Line Media, a developer of BAFTA award-winning video games like The Amazing Never Alone, which I just started with my daughter, and we haven't gotten very far yet but I'm sure we will soon. Uh, prior to that, he was CEO and co-founder of Netomat, a leader in mobile web community solutions. He also spent six years at Act Activision, which is a global leader in entertainment software. And he really turned uh, the, that company around. He turned it from a company that was in bankruptcy to a company that has more than a billion dollars in revenue together with his brothers, who I will introduce momentarily. He is co-author of Designing Reality, How to Survive and Thrive in the Third Digital Revolution. Hi, Alan. Please welcome Professor Dr. Joel Kutcher Gershenfeld. He is professor at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University, where he leads research on agile institutions in the 21st century. He was a professor and dean of the School of Labor and Employment Relations at the University of Illinois and a faculty member in MIT's Engineering Systems Division. He is editor for the Negotiation Journal at the Program um, on Negotiation at Harvard Law School, and he has co-authored and co-edited 12 books and countless articles, book chapters, policy papers, and much more on new technology. And he holds a PhD in Industrial Relations from MIT. Hi, Joel. Hello. And we're very delighted uh, to have Professor Dr. Neil Gershenfeld with us um, tonight. And uh, Neil was originally not scheduled to be a part of this panel because he was busy, but we're very happy that he managed to push uh, some um, appointments aside and uh, has a little bit of time for our panel discussion. Neil is a professor at MIT, and he's a director at MIT Center for Bits and Atoms, where they look at the intersection of inter information to its physical representation from nano, micro, meso, and macro. He earned his PhD in physics at Cornell University, and Neil's class, How to Make Almost Everything, led to the creation of Fab Labs a mobile version of which he got to place on the lawn of the White House once. Um, not the last administration, but of course the Obama administration. I think that's important to say. Neil has been extensively featured in newspapers and magazines around the world. Welcome, Neil. Great to have you with us. Happy to be here. So, dear audience, if you would like to use the opportunity to ask our panel questions, you can do so um, by writing the questions directly into the chat. And we should get uh, to these questions at around 7.30 p.m.-ish. And with that, let's begin. Carla, I would like to start with you. Um, now, in the past um, two decades, there's been a lot of hype coming and going with 3D printing. And you wrote your dissertation. Um, looking uh, very closely at 3D printing and also graphene, but we're not going to talk about graphene tonight, just 3D printing. So you looked at 3D printing as an emerging technology and the expectations surrounding it very closely. So can you take us a little bit through the hypes of 3D printing and uh, where it all started and where it is now? Um, so I'll, I'll do my best. As you said, it was my PhD thesis, so it's a bit rusty. Uh, but <laughs> Um, yeah, so first, uh, just a hype, I guess everybody knows what a hype is, but uh, 
I have is something that happens with a lot of new technologies and emerging technologies um, where they get a lot of uh, media attention because um, there's a lot of promises and expectations around. Uh, but um, it, it has this, always this negative connotation, but there's also a positive side to it in the sense that because there's so much attention and there, there's, there's resources, there's space to experiment. And, and so, so I looked at hypes as a social phenomenon and, and, and how this affected the 3D printing community at that time. Um, so as Christoph said earlier, 3D printing is rather, um, it started in the 80s um, as like the kind of the fundamental ideas, but um, I think it only got the attention and the imagination of uh, people and the broader public when ideas of 3D printing as a means to a revolution, a social revolution that would respond to issues of um, resource constraints, would fundamentally change our economy, or were put um, out in, I don't know, in the, in, in the cyberspace, I would say, uh, and, and the lack of a very wor better word, um, by people that were sharing um, um, designs for 3D printings that could reproduce themselves. Um, so you had a technology that broke uh, with the paradigm of something that was scarce um, and that could like enable a new um, epoch of uh, yeah, uh, richness uh, or a new economy. Uh, and this peaked, I would say, around 2012, 2013, um, yeah, uh, when uh, I don't know, many things happened, but I think one was that there was a company, um, I don't know if there still is, called MakerBot that uh, released a print printer that was called The Replicator, um, that was very famous. Um, there, were, um, there was a book about makers by Chris Anderson. Um, there was uh, obviously the Fab Labs. So, so things started to come together and created a lot of um, excitement around this technology. Um, I think in 2013, there was a 3D printed gun, which is probably an event that also everybody has heard about, uh, which it's also something um, that happens during hypes that um, technologies are not only explored because of what they promise to do uh, good for society, but also um, in terms of risk. And it's a lot of the time fears are raised that are not necessarily, um, you know, that, that don't have necessarily a lot of, um, so, um, sort of, uh, yeah, there's nothing, uh, there's not a lot behind it. But uh, yeah, in the case of the 3D printed gun, this was probably when it really reached policy makers. Uh, we had like the European Parliament even discussing at some point the 3D printed gun uh, and whether there was something that needed to regulate, needed to be rigid or regulate. And um, I was actually looking at the at media attention of 3D printing the other day just to, um, see whether the hype went away. And I think uh, it hasn't really. Um, I think, um, it, although it doesn't appear in the newspapers as much, it's still quite um, search within uh, in the internet. Uh, and in terms of the technology itself, I think what happens after hypes is that um, the, the fields start, st start to structure and they become a little bit more, um, they develop business models, they diversify, they specify um, what are, you know, what are different promises and, and, and then they also build up more close relations with other stakeholders and actors in society. But I guess that's what comes next in the panel, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, the last type you would have said would have been 2012. And then, of course, we're going to talk about where we're at now. But since 2012, it died down, would you say? Or I don't think it died down. I think it, um, so a lot of technologies, um, so, so in hypes, you have different patterns. So you have technologies that go to a very high hype and then they die down and sort of disappear. So if you know if you have heard of the artificial intelligence winter that happened in the 60s, if I'm correct, I don't know. I'm bad with numbers. Uh, uh, but in the way, that that was like a big promise and it, it, it disappeared from the discussion um, because it was not fulfilled. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the promise, the technology dies. It's rather that it, it just um, goes away from the, the public discussion. There's other technologies like hydrogen, for instance, uh, that had a hype and um, also at the same time as 3D printing a little bit earlier. And then it became part of our collective portfolio of technologies that we think are 
the next generation of solutions without really dying down, but rather stabilizing within um, the public sphere. Um, yeah, so I think with 3D printing, that's what happened. Um, so it didn't die down. It's not that somebody said this is not fulfilling the promise, but rather, I think, um, and as we saw it during the COVID crisis, uh, the promise is still there, very much alive in many people that are willing to use 3D printing to solve the problems of scarcity when they are and um, when they um, appear. Uh, but it it did um, started, I don't know, kind of becoming more concrete in a way. Um, especially, so so there was specialization, um, there was uh, regulations coming up, new business models, actors even within the field become more reflexive about what they do. Yeah. Thank you, Carla. Neil, let me ask you, uh, seeing that we're sort of still in the past a little bit and uh, catching up to the present and then the future, can you take us back how Fab Labs were created and maybe also, Neil, what your expectations were back then? Sure, and also let me frame that with, um, we keep saying 3D printing, what is 3D printing? It has two meanings. One, a narrower one is additive manufacturing. Um, a broader one, it gets used to mean digital to physical. And um, I really wanna separate them. I run a lab at MIT that has one of almost every machine to make anything. And it includes 3D printers, but it includes many other machines. And in fact, people would be more upset if I took away the other machines than the 3D printer. It's one of the tools. Uh, we do research on roadmap up to how you make something like a replicator. Um, I started a class how to make almost anything to teach to use it that was very popular. That led to Fab Labs. And that began as an outreach project, not to tell people what we're doing, but give them the means. So a Fab Lab today, it's about a hundred thousand dollar investment, about two tons. It fills a room. It includes a three D printer, but it also includes nine or so other tools that together let you make complete functional systems, form and function. And so, in that, the role of the three D printer it's sort of like the role of a microwave in a kitchen. Saying you know the microwave is the future of the kitchen. It, it's a powerful tool, but there's a number of other tools you need to to cook. So in the same sense, Fab Labs integrate additive and subtractive and um, surface mount rework and embedded programming and laying up composites and molding and casting, things all over this map that don't even fit just additive versus subtractive. And they spread virally. We, we plan to set up one and go back to work. There's over 2,000 now in 125 countries, a number of very lively ones in Germany. And they've been used to, for business, for outreach, for education, for play, for infrastructure. And they've been doubling every year and a half for about a decade, what's come to be called Lass's Law. And so we're really at the edge of 50 years of the scaling. And I'll close with the thing to understand about Fab Labs is their job is to make themselves obsolete. It, they're similar in the history of computing to the room filling uh, mini computers. They were used to create the internet, but in turn, they were used to create the generations of technology that followed. So fab labs are being used to figure out how does the world work if anybody can make anything today, but they're also being figure, being used to figure out how fab labs can make fab labs and, and in a sense make their existing form obsolete. I have to say, I was really surprised. Um, I saw a picture of your fab lab uh, a little bit earlier at MIT and the 3D printer only takes out a tiny little corner of the entire lab. Um, so I thought it was gonna be this big deal. And in fact, it's not, there's all these other machines that are a lot more, if not, you know, just as important. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say more important, but I'd say, it's a suite of capabilities. So again, you can add material, you can subtract material, you can place parts, you can mold. There's, there's many different digital. So a good phrase is digital fabrication. It's all digital control of machines, but the space of processes is much richer than just a simple additive versus subtractive difference. Let's move, uh, let's move on to the status quo now that we've sort of established the past a little bit. Let's move to the status quo and also the current situation, which is of course COVID. And Joel, I'd like to um, begin with you in this segment. Now during Corona, um, be it in the States, be it in Germany or worldwide, a lot of industries are struggling with the current um, situation, are struggling with unemployment. Unemployment is high and on the rise. Are there 
would you say problem problem solving approaches uh, from the way fab labs work or from the way people in fab labs work that could be applied here in helping um, these situations, helping industries and in, uh, lowering unemployment? Uh, I would say three things. Thank you very much, uh, Kimsey, for the question. First is, it is true, and you can see this all around the world, fab labs and maker spaces have leaned in to produce PPE and other components and parts, uh, often in coordination with each other and at scale, whether it's in India or Southern California or lots of places. Neil's research group looked at the underlying physics of what's needed to make the, the equipment safe and designs had to be modified and adjusted and spread. But there's no question first that the pandemic has had people working together, leaning in and demonstrating what digital fabrication can do in a crisis. Good news. Second thing is in Italy, one of the first groups to really lean in was in Northern Italy. And what happened is that the regulators in charge of health um, policy gave them a cease and desist order saying, you're not licensed to produce medical products. The hospital said, forget what they're saying, we need your products. And that's the beginning of a whole conversation in which the institutions aren't aligned to deal with distributed production that isn't necessarily a business, but a community center, a library, a museum, a university lab. Um, and so there's a disjuncture that's also been revealed by the pandemic. The last thing that I would say is what we don't know is what will continue after the pandemic. And clearly what we even mean by after is when the curve of infections globally um, reaches a point at which it's no longer spreading, it's no longer exponential. And it may become some time before then, but there is a deep fundamental question. We know people can cooperate in a crisis, but will that cooperation continue after a crisis? Would you think it would? Some of the distributed networks have incorporated as worker cooperatives and as other institutional structures that will certainly continue. Many of them had cooperative relationships with commercial enterprises. So Coca-Cola sent lots of plastic to a group of, of fab labs in Southern California, I mean, Northern California, uh, because they needed the plastic to make the PPE. And so they had a cooperative relationship. Will Coke always provide them with the raw materials? Probably not. Um, that's not their business model. So the answer will be, there will be some innovations and some of them could be transformational, but there's also, I think, some folks that will reestablish business as usual uh, and may be uh, disappointing. So if I go one step back, now you just mentioned that there's conversations that are now being had that weren't had before the crisis. Um, so face shields are being made and uh, made by people who might not have a you know, medical background. Um, but do you believe that 3D printing could make the medical system or companies or schools or whichever area that you look at um, be more flexible, be more individualized and also more innovative in general? So first of all, as Neil says, it's not just 3D printing. It's, it's the whole suite of digital fabrication technologies that ultimately I think is relevant. And yes, I do think that in remote villages, uh, in urban food deserts that have been ignored by the global supply chains, folks will find technologies that make them more self-sufficient attractive. It's also the case, however, that they have to do this often in spite of the system, not because of it. Some cities are leaning in and saying, we want our whole city to be more self-sufficient and are realigning the institutions to support that. But I'd say those are just baby steps at this point. Um, and so if you really want to think of this as a complete rethinking of global supply chains, where the technology that bits or the atoms, as Neil would say, stay local, even if the designs are shared globally, uh, that is working at a minimal level. You know, 2000 fab labs is fantastic, but there are hundreds of thousands of cities around the world. And the question is, at what point do you bump up against folks who have invest vested interests that in some way or another are threatened? And how will we resolve those disputes? 
So would Barcelona be one example of a city with Barcelona's commitment to, to change their structure? Certainly, Neil can say more about it, but um, Barcelona is um, really a city that envisions every neighborhood having a local fab lab, every home having some productive capability, and every regional um, center having a large mega production facility so that, uh, as Neil would say, it's not a transmission belt for products to garbage, but rather designs come in digitally uh, materials, local and, and otherwise, are used to produce things, and in a sense, the atoms stay local. So Joel, I have uh, one last question for you in this segment. Um, now, you've, uh, you've been in, uh, or how can I say, I watched your keynote earlier and there was a, the labor and trade uh, meetings that you had to deal with. So you've been in sticky situations that you've managed to get everybody out perfectly. Um, so how would you say do organizations need to um, be structured to face and master the, as you call it, third digital revolution? Do we need less hierarchy? Do we need more collaboration? Do we need, what do we need? What do they need? I'll share with you what I call the N plus one rule. So in labor management relations, it's common to say that one agreement takes three, an agreement within labor, within management, and between the two. When you have N stakeholders, it takes N plus one agreements to get one. Each stakeholder has to do its internal alignment to then do the lateral alignment across stakeholders. Some organizations have the capability to both do internal alignment and to do lateral alignment with others. Many organizations don't. They don't have a committee on consortia, a committee to say, how are we gonna be part of multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives and activities? We see multi-stakeholder institutional forms growing in popularity. I believe they will be a defining arrangement for the 21st century but it does take every organization building the ability to be part of collaborative enterprises as well as their own internal structure. Uh, and that's something in which there's still a lot of work to be done. And is it something that can be like, how can you help these organizations move into the right direction if they're, if they're not ready yet? So partly it involves rethinking the rules of the game, the incentives, the structures within organizations, what's valued, what's lifted up. But it goes deeper, it goes deeper to the underlying culture, the deeply embedded assumptions for how we do things. Uh, and so in a sense, to be successful in the 21st century, most organizations, nonprofit, government, commercial, and uh, NGOs, all will be on a culture change journey to be part of a future that involves both collaboration and competition. Thank you. Alan, I'll uh, move on to you. Um, now, collaboration, of course, is the key word, as uh, we've heard just now and also during the day today, now during COVID. People, companies, um, organizations have been collaborating through the internet, working together to, say, produce face shields, as an example. Maker versus Virus here in Germany is one such initiative where 6,500 helpers uh, were brought together uh, to produce face shields. And Neil, of course, you, you track initiatives like this. What can we learn about how people work together from this? So one of the interesting things just about working with, with my two brothers is we come from very different fields, science, social science, and humanities. And, you know, I work, I work mostly in video games, which seems totally removed from anything we're talking about, but in some ways not. I mean, the, the theory of why billions and billions and billions of lean forward hours are immersed in these games has some clues to some of the answers to, I think, your questions. The Gamers are very good at working together to solve problems, often as, as individuals, as small groups, and, and as mass communities. If people share an aspirational goal, so if there's an aspirational but achievable goal around, say, how digital fabrication can empower 
societies. That's important, the storytelling, appealing to the heart. What is the vision that people are aspiring to is a key piece of the puzzle. And I think that came up with Christoph er earlier on. I don't think we do a good job of that. Most of our stories are dystopian when it comes to technology because they're more dramatic. Movies, video games, graphic novels. We have a generation growing up on a dystopian stories. We need aspirational, but achievable and evocative stories. But crucially, once people have those stories, one of the things that people miss that really good game designers understand is the feedback loops that you're making stable steps towards a goal you're invested in. And those feedback loops are absolutely critical. So when you were talking to Joel about whether some of these innovations will continue, in a sense, there were some positive feedback loops. People had agency. It's Everybody needs agency. Everyone needs to feel like they matter and they need to matter. Their actions have to have consequences. And if those consequences are positive, especially in a collaborative sense, and they're getting feedback that lives are being saved or their community is benefiting, that's very powerful, but you need to keep build on those stable steps and see progress towards these big aspirational goals. I think if those things are in place, you know, we'll be cultivating dispositions and mindsets as well as actual capabilities to realize some of these goals. I thought it was really interesting what you said just now and what you said earlier. The question is what stories do we tell? And the question in general, is there a story being told? And that sort of struck me as well, you know, in my personal opinion, if I compare Germany to the States, Germany is not a yes, let's all pitch in together and do something. And America would be, you know, in my mind, more a country where people, you know, just, you know, button, you know, just pull up their sleeves and start working. So maybe the 6,500 people that got active in printing face shields and coming together is because they had this story to tell. Would you agree? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we live, as people in a society of collective visions. I mean, you know, we talked about money in that uh, survey. Money is just a collective fiction. You know, we, we, we have a lot of collective fictions that, that drive our ability to function as collaborating humans. And I think those collective fictions, those collective visions, if they're positive, people can, can rally around them. But it does take evocative storytellers. It takes evocative visions to make them come to life. You know, you, you mentioned the past. And you started, I think, the past, uh, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago. I think we should go maybe a thousand years ago. Uh, the game behind me is a game we did with an Alaska Native tribal organization, um, taking stories that have been passed down literally for thousands of years and putting them into a video game collaboratively with the community. When I introduced the community to Neil, they immediately embraced Fab Labs and they have uh, some pioneering Fab Labs within the indigenous community. In fact, it was honored at, at the Obama a White House. But what's interesting is, the ability to make things, and they often make things at a community level. They share their hunting, fishing, crafting, and that's the way they've survived in some of the harshest climates on the planet. And so this idea of community-based self-sufficiency has been around for a long time and in, in many ways is, is coming back with these powerful tools. So the blending of ancient practices in a community context with accelerating technology grounded in the values of a community, I think is a powerful story to tell. Uh, and I'm not sure it's one that is being told. Mm -mm. And, and if I might add, if you look at these ancient communities, yes, there was economic trade with in a sense money, but there was also barter and exchange and other means by which um, people uh, got uh, acquired what they needed. I think the digital future ahead with digital fabrication will probably include market economies, but will also include barter, exchange, community activities. Uh, I think we need to think broadly. So Alan's comment about money being a fiction, I actually think that we need to have aspirational visions about the very nature of the economic institutions. What, what I think is interesting about that, um, in reading your book, of course, and reading about how the collaboration came with the native tribe, um, what really struck me when you talk about bartering and the past and also the future is that if I understood correctly, then the native tribe um, didn't take any money for that collaboration, but they instead invested in your company so that there's a future that you would have together. I thought that was really fascinating. I mean, yeah. Very Go ahead, Neil. Yeah. Um, it, Bhutan, you may know, is based on gross national happiness. It doesn't mean they're happy, but it means rather than gross domestic product, they don't measure money, they measure well being, health, 
um, stress attainment. And we've been working with them on local fab labs and now super fab labs because they have this great mental inner space, but they're at the end of these long supply chains from China and India and Japan um, to embody it. And what they're doing, what Barcelona is doing is really questioning what's a relatively recent economic assumption that the role of money is something you work for to acquire than to purchase things. And if the means to make are democratized, it's not utopia, it's not free, but it breaks this equivalent of jobs equals work equals money equals consumption. That's not how most uh, through human history society has worked. It's this basin we've been in relatively recently. And this isn't intangible, it's very concrete in places like Barcelona or Bhutan, they're really revisiting these very basic notions of what is an economy. It's, it's much more disruptive than just a better way to make stuff. Absolutely. Angela, I'd like to um, move on to you. Now you're an expert on intellectual property rights and 3D printing. If uh, we're still staying at the present right now, not quite looking into the future yet, but can you tell us and our audience, what are the current legal implications with 3D printing? Um, if I look at open source versus uh, intellectual property, what do I need to bear in mind there? How long do we have? Uh, maybe not uh, long enough for a very long explanation. Um, okay, but what is the issue with 3D printing and IP? We've got an issue in theory and, an, and maybe less of an issue, but maybe now a growing issue in practice. The issue in theory is that having um, radically decentralized fabrication technology, if that's the right way to put it, according to the technical experts, um, that represents a very different paradigm to how manufacturing has been happening, um, mass manufacturing anyway, um, in kind of more centralized ways. And increasingly um, in China, um, that a lot of the goods and objects that we use in developed, but a lot of developing countries as well, come from there specifically. Um, Sorry, somebody's just trying to call me uh, on my phone. Um, okay, I'll just throw that over there. Right. <laughs> um, okay, so 3D printing disrupts that paradigm. Our intellectual property laws are broadly set up around um, centralized manufacturing happening um, and it kind of being controllable in that way. I mentioned earlier today that just an example of that would be patent laws, uh, which are based or premised on the idea or the assumption, because it's not explicit in patent laws, that it's going to be too difficult for most people to be able to make a patented invention because they would need um, specific knowledge, know-how, um, complicated equipment. Now, 3D printing, um, maybe not quite the hundred pound, euro, dollar, name your currency models, but um, perhaps slightly more expensive models, you might be able to print out something that in principle could be protected by a patent. Um, so that is why 3D, and then of course, uh, the digitalization of um, information of objects uh, also brings us into the realm of copyright and brings us very much into the realm of the huge battles that have been happening um, around copyright for at least the last 20 years, maybe more like 25, 30 years and have their origins um, even before then as well. Um, so all of the kind of issues we've been having with copyright, file sharing, digitalization of content, we potentially also have with 3D printing. So these are, this is kind of the broad, um, issue with IP, uh, with other areas of law, well, obviously being able to print out guns uh, is quite challenging for firearms regulation, um, and particularly in countries outside of the US where there's quite strict um, control over uh, who can own a weapon, a firearm in particular. And even in the US, it's not as if um, uh, it's an unregulated space either. Um, although obviously it's a di slightly different scenario with the Second Amendment. Okay, anyway, 3D printing also presents a lot of challenges in principle to these laws as well. The reality until recently, I would say, has been a bit different. Um, my research on the topic has been going on for the last nine years. Um, and while there's been all this kind of uh, concern, some people have been quite excited about the pr prospect of IP being challenged in a really big way. Um, I would say we're not really seeing the same kind of big disruption that we saw with 
file sharing and the 1990s and copyrighted content just yet. I think there's various reasons why that's the case. Um, usability of 3D printers, uh, pre-existing supply chains, manufacturing, um, also being an issue, uh, being a reason why not, um, that this is all working reasonably well in many places, not perfectly, not perfectly for everyone, um, but for those maybe, you know, in developed countries, in big cities, it's kind of easy to get what you need, except things are now changing a bit with the COVID situation that we've got, uh, where you just need to read the news in the last year or watch the news uh, to see that actually we've not been able to access everything we could possibly want. Um, we've had huge issues accessing personal protective equipment, um, maybe to a lesser extent, um, as mentioned earlier, ventilators. And now we've got the big issue of vaccines. And I know this is a really big issue in the EU. And currently my official country, the UK, is having a big fight with the EU <laughs> over access to vaccines. Um, and vaccines being produced in the EU sent to the UK. So I think we're now seeing even in kind of the most developed uh, parts of the world that actually um, this whole paradigm around centralized manufacturing happening kind of often elsewhere and being shipped um, to us um, is perhaps not working in the same way as it did before. And, and there's also other issues around uh, countries wanting um, for national security reasons um, or reasons of sustainability or resilience to be able to access what they need um, and not have to wait for production to happen elsewhere and particularly in China. And I'm hinting at um, check tensions between China and the US, where Europe is also somewhat involved as well as other parts of the world too. So I think all of this uh, kind of coming to the point, all of this is really adding up to um, questions about um, this paradigm and where distributed manufacturing or fabrication, um, including 3D printing, but not limited to 3D printing, uh, can come in uh, to produce stuff more locally. But one of the big issues at the moment, and we see this very clearly with the vaccines, is that if there are patents involved, whoever owns the patent can um, uh, allow manufacturing to happen in certain places, but not allow it to happen in others and can put a price on that. And that, I think finally, we might be at a situation where distributed manufacturing or fabrication is has clear is clearly desirable uh, for a whole lot of reasons, but their IP may be producing some roadblocks. Just to kind of finish up, and because you did ask about um, open source, um, well, open source or open uh, licensing, more than just open source, um, is a way of asserting intellectual property rights, such as copyright, such as patents, in non-traditional ways. So traditionally, um, having these rights, you would be quite careful about who you allow to use them and for what price and blocking others from using them. So if you do um, license, um, so that means letting other people use whatever it is, your copyright or patent in particular, on an open basis, um, then that means um, you don't. people don't have to ask you for permission. There's a kind of general permission that I've invented a COVID vaccine. <laughs> um, I've used and um, I've got a patent for it, uh, which might prevent someone else getting a patent for it. But I've decided to license um, the invention on an open basis, and I don't want anyone to pay me for it. Um, so that it, sometimes as well, um, people might not, um, particularly in the case of patent, claim a patent and just kind of. Um, make their invention discoverable to the world um, and say that I don't want anyone to pay me for it. Um, and we see this as a characteristic of a lot of hacker and maker communities um, as well. So some people view that open source and open hardware as a kind of hack of intellectual property because sometimes an IP right is asserted, but just in a non-traditional way. And in some cases, it's a clear subversion of the IP system. Uh, but IP is still here and still relevant and including traditional ways of asserting IP and still problematic. But what about the question of liability? Sorry. Like if I if you give people the right to print your uh, very own COVID vaccine um, and somebody's printer has a malfunction, who's liable then? Well, this is something really difficult to answer because it depends a lot on the particular circumstances. So if the if the printer 
if, if it's the printer which has caused the problem and is defective, then, well, if it's a printer you've built yourself and you didn't build it properly, then you're the one who's at fault, okay, most fine. likely. But if it's, you know, an open hardware printer that you've downloaded um, online or you've downloaded uh, files for online and then you've printed it out or made it yourself and it was actually the defect was kind of with the how the files were configured or the um, parts within the files, then it begins to become more complicated. Um, might The fault might lie with whoever has made um, the design or distributed the files. So this is when it gets to be really complicated because it, I, I can't give a kind of, I can give you an, a, a very broad answer to your particular uh, scenario, but how every scenario will depend on what actually has happened. So giving hard and fast rules is difficult. Also, all, while there might be some commonality between different legal systems, there still is a lot of divergence about, you know, um, it might be that in Germany you're liable, but if you're in the UK, you're not because the law has developed in different ways. And actually IP as well still has quite a lot of uh, divergence, even though there is international treaties around IP the facts on the ground and how the, the laws in each country do diverge to some extent. So this is a really difficult issue when you've got a global technology. So okay, if I could just add one comment to Angela's, um, in the space of open, closed and make money, not many, we're used to the corners. So uh, closed, make money, open for free. But right now what's most interesting technically is open and make money. and there's a misconception about that corner. So uh, open source has won for software to a great extent. Google and Microsoft for software have become essentially open source companies. They don't make money from keeping proprietary control over software. They make money from services and how they add value and what they build on top of the software. And the same thing is happening now in hardware. There's a really lively open hardware movement one of the most interesting parts of it, for example, is what's called RISC-V, which is a complete end-to-end -end design of a um, microprocessor like ARM or Intel, but done with an open design, you then build businesses around. And so in the Fab Lab network, people come in wanting patents. I have to explain, patents are only useful if there's a barrier to infringement and you can identify infringement. And that doesn't apply to anything you can do in a Fab Lab. There, there's no way to sort of serve summons on earth the barrier is so low, but it doesn't mean you can't make money with open designs, but you don't make money by protecting the designs. The business models are much more interesting. See, and, and interesting, if I might add on, what um, both Angela and Neil are describing is technology that is interoperable and extensible. That is, you can use things in modular form with each other and you can add to it, work with it because it's open. But as Neil is saying, it doesn't mean that you can't be entrepreneurial. The interesting question is, can organizations or institutions be interoperable and extensible? That is, even though Google and others may lean in with open source or in fact, R might be, you know, be in a whole ecosystem of users, the businesses that are set up are still in some ways have closed walls around them because they want to maintain their uh, entrepreneurial identity. But in a sense, can you have collaborative enterprises that connect across enterprises in new forms? Uh, in a sense, ecosystems, not industries. Uh, and that's an interesting space in which we ask, what about, what about the social systems that surround the technical systems? And you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that in an even broader direction. Um, in in and and this is an, another area where the game industry is pioneering some interesting practices. So in the massive games out there like Minecraft and Roblox that literally reach hundreds of millions, if not a billion, folks, people are constantly adapting and extending the content. And the chain of attribution uh, is a really interesting question. And it's not just a technical and legal question because people are constantly modding and modifying art, design, stories, code, and files. And th there's a real question in terms of 
what, what credit do I get? How do I get acknowledged, even if it's not financial? But because a lot of these modifications are being monetized, there are financial implications as to what was my contribution? What was the community's contribution? And we're doing it at the scale of, of hundreds of, of millions of people. And so things like the distributed ledger and, and, and the blockchain type technologies are interesting distributed technologies that can track attribution in a distributed way. And, and the game industry is leaning very, very heavily into this as we get into a modding and remixing culture. Thank you very much. You did a remix also of Minecraft, Minecraft okay. education, right? Yeah, our company partnered with a company called Teacher Gaming. We had the rights to do a modification, a mod of Minecraft for schools, specifically for schools. And so we, we, we basically took all of the amazing teacher curriculum that was out there that was building on this creation centric world. And it was just taking off like crazy in schools. And we reached uh, over 10,000 schools. But what's interesting is we were one of many thousands of mods that were doing everything from UN civic engagement to everything you could imagine. That's the way a game as a service becomes an ecosystem and a global movement when people can adapt and extend it, but within the rules and culture of that ecosystem. Let me add just one more interesting example to that. Alan and I were part of a research project um, where we were funded to take the research tools I'm developing and turn them into a video game and uh, to, to expand access to help teach people to make it fun. And there was initially this big split in that um, my technical team just wanted to make a digital version of our lab where you could go in the lab and do exactly what we do, but, but in the game. Uh, Alan's team wanted to make this crazy, you know, it's far in the future and you're flying a super spaceship and you can teleport and uh, go through wormholes and, and, you know, and, you know, stuff that had no physical grounding. And then what emerged from it was this really creative tension where Alan's team pushed my team to take seriously what we were trying to do and what would it look like to live in that world. And we took Alan's team to be inventive, but grounded in physics. And it forced both of us to end up in a place neither of us had been to sort of build this world at, the, at, at this place that is beyond where we were, were thinking in the present, but is grounded in real physics. It was a really rich collaboration. And you were still comfortable in that space? Uh, Abs absolutely not. No, just joking. <laughs> you know, it, it was really exhilarating. And I can tell you for the game makers and the storytellers, to see their ideas emerge in the, in the actual science roadmap is, a, is really, really, really exhilarating. And it was, you know, it, it took a lot of norming of the cultures and, and even norming of the language to be able to even effectively communicate. But once that happened, it was really an exhilarating partnership. And, and I might note that in studies of cross-cultural collaboration, sometimes people bridge from one culture to another, but what's most exciting is when what we call third cultures emerge that are neither of the two or whatever the number is um, base cultures, but that in a sense represent uh, a blending and a new way of interacting that derives from the others, but is its own emergent culture. So I'd like to move into the future a little bit now because the topic here of course is the future and before our time runs out so I'd like to open the question to our entire panel um, here also um, the information that if you dear audience members have questions for our panel please write them into our little Q&A session um, section there and we'll post them uh, as, as soon as we can but let's uh, get to the future and post COVID and of course the societal changes uh, that we're hoping for so dear panel, what do you think? Could 3D printing be an important step towards a more local, a more responsible, and of course, also a more resilient economy after the pandemic? What would you say? I'd like to start right off with uh, sort of two edits to the question. So the first edit is 3D printing. Again, it's like asking, is the microwave oven the future of cooking? Um, uh, the space of digital fabrication, controlling machines to make things is much bigger than 3D printing. Unless you wanna redefine 3D printing to mean that whole space, redefine the question to be digital fabrication. Um, that's the immediate one. Then the deeper one is if you look at the research roadmap in a lab like mine, the really interesting distinction is not between additive and subtractive because they're both analog. 
the really interesting one is between analog processes, whether additive or subtractive, cutting or extruding, and digital processes that assemble and disassemble. Molecular biology computes to construct. There's codes in the material. It's a profound distinction that lets you express algorithms and error correct and create the complexity of all of us on this call. And in the research roadmap, what we're studying is assemblers and disassemblers that work with digitized materials with codes in their construction. And that's how you ultimately realize the research vision for what we're describing. So it's really important that that was two recursions, start from 3D printing, generalize it to digital fabrication, and then recognize today that's an analog process and generalize it to digital, this deeper sense of digital fabrication of coding the materials. And that's how you can run the 50 year technical roadmap and then with those clarifications, we can then think through what, what does it mean to have that 50 years of scaling? So would it be more local, more responsible and more resilient? <laughs> oh, uh, unambiguously, the, you know, uh, um, it, it's a bit overused, but William Gibson has this wonderful observation that the future is here today. It's just not uniformly distributed. And if you look at what's going on in, in this network of labs, it's, it's building sustainable futures based on alternate economic models where you think globally and fabricate locally. And th that's happening today. And um, you know, exponentials are exponential. We went from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 and we're going to, to the next powers. You know, in the same way that Gordon Moore very accurately described just about everything happened other than missing spam and fake news and income inequality. Which, which is a big focus for today, um, the accessibility, the, the um, universality, the you know, changing economic models is here today. You don't need to be a visionary. You just need to recognize it's not uniformly distributed and think about how we can shape it rolling out. Carla, do you think those expectations uh, can be met in the future with digital fabrication? Um, is that the way to go into the future to be more local, responsible, and resilient? Um, that's a big question. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer it. Um, I was thinking when I was hearing Neil's uh, response um, and, and, and also while well, reading your book, um, your recent book and the chapter by Joel and Alan, um, I think the big question is always scaling. Um, so when you have a big, a promising technology and you're able to think around and do experiments and explore alternative versions of the future, um, th these alternatives have existed throughout uh, history and since the industrial revolution at different scales. Um, so um, I don't know, alternative um, social arrangements or alternative uses for technology. Um, and somehow, and for some reason that I don't fully understand, they get uh, integrated within the status quo rather than challenging it. Um, so I think the big question is, um, and, and a, a lot of, a lot of um, thinkers, um, Joel mentioned also in his presentation today, are thinking that this is a moment where we are able to challenge the status quo. But um, to me, the big question is is how and and what is this? What is the status? What is of that status quo that we do need to challenge? Um, I was reading just a piece um, now that I learned a, a quote from a former Russian president whose name I forgot that says, um, we, we wanted the best and we um, ended up with the usual. Um, so how we can avoid that, I think um, it's a big challenge in the process of scaling it up. Um, I think the expectations are, are great and, and they should be guided into this um, societal process of steering and, and creating those spaces, the new organizations and so on. But, uh, but then maybe you get to a point where you have to ask difficult questions, who's in control, who value, whose values are, 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 are being um, taken up from and so on. Thank you, Carla. Um, okay, dear audience members, um, in uh, just a few moments, you can ask your question. So if you have a question uh, to our panel, just write it into the chat now. We'll get to it very soon. Um, I have another question for the panel. So if we flip the coin a little bit, instead of looking positively into the um, future, futures, as we learned, plural, um, the futures of digital fabrication and 3D printing are the 
possibilities for societal change may be also overrated. Are there things that digital fabrication and 3D printing can't fix? What would you say? Well, it's certainly the case that um, with the second digital revolution and the first digital, fab digital communication and digital computation, that we've seen the emergence of digital divides. And the ability of digital fabrication by itself to um, bridge the idea of haves and have nots is still very much an open question. And uh, it's something in which uh, sociologists and social scientists talk about the social construction of reality. That is, the technology is not deterministic. It's up to us how we shape the technology and how society and technology co-evolve. And so, you know, some of what Angela was describing earlier about the legal systems that surround the technology when it comes to intellectual property, uh, I think that, you know, there's a broader question about whether people have the incentives and the legal support um, to think of this as, as Alan mentioned in his remarks earlier, as a right rather than you know, a market outcome. Um, because right now, um, I think there is still a risk of a digital divide with the third digital revolution. Yeah, I, I think the, the I, I mentioned in the earlier presentation, you know, close to half the planet doesn't have access to the internet uh, and broadband and, and a very large percentage has minimal access based on business models. And this whole vision of being globally connected but locally self-sufficient falls down when most of the planet doesn't still have the ability to be effectively globally connected. I mean, that just speaks to a digital divide leading to an even bigger fab divide. And then the literacies, which are, are just not baked into the learning, because this is hard. It's hardware, it's software, it's the biochemistry of the materials. So a lack of fab literacy, fab divides will have huge implications on some negative trends that are accelerating globally. And I would say some of the most terrifying things that I observed in the book coming in a little bit from the outside is the biofab and just the manipulating of, of, of what it means to be human. And that being becoming democratized is, you know, potentially amazing in terms of curing perhaps diseases, but is absolutely terrifying in terms of, you know, if people are, uh, proactively thinking through the risks as they're sort of joyfully experimenting, the stakes become very, very high. So the risks here are, are, are high. And it's why it is important to, to look at this as much bigger than 3D printing. The manipulation of, of bits, atoms, and molecules becoming more and more accessible is, is, is just accelerating all of the good and bad at the same time. So you mentioned biofab, biofab as if in as if I uh, use Angela's self-printed COVID vaccine, or if I print a, a an elbow for myself, or what is biofab? So yeah, it, it, yeah it, it's it's more fundamental. So with a fab, let's see, fab, the Fab Academy spun off a bio academy led by a colleague, George Church, one of the greatest geneticists. And it's based on a fab lab roughly can make a bio lab. And then with the bio lab, you can do biotechnology. And then much more than an elbow, you can uh, design molecules. Uh, in the research at my lab, we were part of creating synthetic organisms where you design a genome and actually create a cell completely synthetically. That's becoming accessible. It's very powerful. It's very, very dangerous. It's much more scary than a 3D printed gun. You can do really, really serious harm that way. But what's been emerging is you can't control it by regulation. You can't, so biosafety, the way it's done today is MIT has a biosafety office and there's rules and they check what we do. If anybody at a fab lab scale can be doing biotechnology, you can enforce, you can't check on uh, every one of them. And what's been emerging is the way to protect it is there has to be incentives for transparency, incentives for safety. You have to give people benefits for working openly and, and following safety protocols rather than working in secret. There's no real way to lock it down. And so you can't control safety with command and control the way we've done it traditionally. Um, you have to do it by, by, by pulling people out and providing incentives. Yeah, I'd like to actually ask Angela a question building on what Neil said. <clears throat> so. Almost every medical system in every country around the world has some kind of medical ethics review panel, but they don't scale to what Neil was describing about 
widely distributed ability to do things that affect um, biology and health. Um, Angela, what would be your vision of a legal system um, broadly defined that could operate at scale around issues like this? Because um, right now the inherited institutions aren't at all matched to the risks that are being described. <laughs> um, okay, um, I, I can't give, I'm not imaginative enough, imaginative enough to give you that answer of like what the legal system needs to look like, in, you know, internationally, globally, I can be very naysaying, but as you know already, there's a lot of issues with what we have already, think about kind of lack of international cooperation on a lot of issues as well, so it will be very difficult to achieve something in practice but why not be utopian and dream of how it could be what i would say and, and what I would, way, I would also say even naming some of the barriers that you see is a step towards thinking through what might be possible but go ahead <laughs> um well where can we start with the barriers uh, but suffice <laughs> it to say um what I, I wanted to say though was that even if i do kind of uh, think of something really wonderful um in, legally speaking I don't think it's going to be enough, and I think we that's I think we need uh, shifts in uh, things like well po politics, shifts in governance more generally, um, even just basic things like more cooperation between different parts agencies of the same countries or the agencies of the same government in the same country, which often doesn't actually happen kind of inexplicably. And I know there, there are people listening to this who know kind of more than uh, me about it, um, looking kind of actually at regulatory processes, even on just one thing like medical devices. And I'm hinting at Antonia Horst, who's in the um, one of the audience members who's done a lot of research on this uh, in 3D printing additive manufacturing. OK. So even just that basic level of cooperation in many cases would be quite useful. Um, but yeah, I mean, trying, the legal systems of most countries are very slow moving beasts. Um, and we've already seen, you know, difficulties in trying to bring intellectual property kind of in line with, well, the 1990s internet still hasn't really happened very effectively in most parts of the world. Um, so it is really difficult to kind of get that change in practice. I, I just want to come back and say that I don't think it's just about the law. I think there's going to be other shifts as well. I think also kind of the norms among communities who are, it's, if it's scientific communities, kind of engaging. And I don't just mean kind of review boards, but I mean the kind of really practical, professional um, practices and norms are really key and important and things that lawmakers or lawyers don't really understand very well or because they don't really understand the subject matter very well, for instance. Um, aside from kind of other systems of uh, governance and control, even socially speaking, politically speaking, economically speaking. Uh, but I do think, you know, to get what the future we want for governance, we need all of this. But certainly there's a lot that the law can do better. And some of it is just basic conversation and understanding what the issue is and that, you know, cooperation, whether it's, you know, with um, on topics that might uh, cut across the domains of traditional or the traditional domains of certain regulatory bodies, they kind of do need to speak to each other. And then at a global level, trying to kind of come up with um, solutions. But another area of my research is around artificial intelligence law and governance and, um, you know, huge amounts of geopolitics involved in that at the international level um, or you get you know shared norms that are so vague that could kind of be interpreted to mean anything to anyone so that is also a big kind of issue with trying to kind of get cooperation especially at an international level so i have more problems than solutions i guess but i do think the solution is quite a multi-layered and multi-domain solution I believe we've got more questions than we have time for. So we should uh, move on to the questions that we have from the audience. Sorry for sort of jumping in there, Angela, but I, ha I had to sort of step in. So one question we get from the audience is the question of public funding. What is the role of public funding in shaping the future of 3D and additive um, or digital fabrication rather? What would you say, dear panel? Uh, I'm gonna give you a, an analog to public funding that we talked about earlier, but it speaks to the importance of significant funding. I mean, clear, clearly, uh, things like broadband access require government 
public funding. Major research requires public funding. But I'm going to use an example from Intel. In the research for our book, we talked to some of the top Intel executives about Moore's Law, since we start the book with an analogy around Moore's Law for digital fabrication. Moore's Law is not a law of nature. It, it, it was a business model for Intel. And the, he, he used this evocative image of Indiana Jones and, and the big boulder behind Indiana Jones in Raiders of the Lost Ark. That was Moore's law to them. They had to stay ahead of it. And they invested billions and billions and billions of dollars to stay ahead of it. And that helped Moore's law stay on track in the digital uh, revolutions in communication and communication to happen. It's an interesting question to say, does the fab ecosystem need that to maintain that pace? Uh, of technology innovation. And then there's a direct analog to public funding. Does public funding for, at, at that level of scale from the government enable the research, enable the access, enable the literacy? I would argue without things at that scale, whether they be public or private, um, it is unlikely that this will maintain the same pace that the first two digital revolutions did. Um, and if I could pick up on a, a second question that follows that one, uh, see, Martin was asking about the technical improvements most needed. The way I'd love to answer is with the technical challenges. So we're doing a lot of work on labs making labs, which means machines making machines, which means making parts of the machines. And we're slowly recursing in on things like how to get closer to doing microelectronics in the lab instead of a billion dollar chip fab to have tabletop ways to make microelectronics. That's how I'd like to answer your question about these next generation technical challenges, but it's not the right answer. The real limitations in labs today generally aren't technical. It's understanding sustainable business models. It's dealing with accreditation for informal learning and formal learning situations. It's handling safety insurance in, in these flexible spaces. It's all of these organizational challenges that are breaking how we separate government aid, industry, education, and all of that. And I'd say what's more rate limiting is organization, not technology. And, and so, and I, uh, so you know, the, the research is happening and that's my day job and that's what I love. Um, and that's traditional government investment, figuring out how to sort of invest. Joel describes it as machines that make machines need organizations that make organizations or institutions that make institutions. That's the real rate limiting profound step. And that's not something we've done before. And if I could just share my screen, I'll share with you an image that speaks to how this can go wrong. Just three failure modes. One is new institutional arrangements are like Godzilla stepping on buildings and doing damage. The other is we have these review panels or these entities that are just uh, seeking resources but not doing anything, essentially zombie arrangements. Or we have monopolists who take um, you know, uh, resources and do it just for themselves. There are lots of ways that things can go wrong institutionally. And the real hard work is figuring out agile, adaptable institutional arrangements that do the core things that institutions have to do, which is creating value and mitigating harm. And each is, by the way, a different kind of undertaking, and both are really hard to do. Fabian had a question, Neil and Alan, for you. Could you explain uh, the virtual fab lab you mentioned briefly? Uh, and what's your experiences and recommendations regarding working in fab labs out of virtual worlds? So, uh, and uh, let me answer and then let me know I have a hard stop at three o'clock. I'd love to keep going. Yeah. Um, when, when the pandemic hit, uh, a bunch of changes happened. And so one was creating fully immersive VR versions of machines where you can go in and interact virtually. That's great, but it's a little bit like reading about or watching exercise or reading about or watching cooking versus eating or exercising. It doesn't take you all the way. Um, a second part was creating remote access to essentially lights out labs where you could run the machines at a distance. That was really successful. But a third part was creating mini labs you could take home. And so bring the lab to you rather than you to the lab. And the intersection of all of those was really productive. And so the virtual fab lab is a fun, great thing, but it, it, it doesn't work in isolation. You need, you need to build those other things around it. 
So I've got one final question from my panel. Um, and due to the time constraints, you uh, can only answer with one sentence. So we talked today about the futures of 3D printing, plural futures, and being able to actively shape these futures by our actions, by our actions today. So instead of asking you as a final question, hey, dear panel, where do you think, where will we be in uh, five years time in regards to 3D printing, or digital fabrication? I'm asking you now, what is your wish, dear panel? Where should we stand in five years time? And Neil, I'll begin with you because you've got uh, 60 seconds before you need to go. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, for me, what's most exciting about this story, and I'll try to keep this to one sentence, is you know, I think of MIT as a safe place for strange people. It's where outliers fit. And that's what, what these labs are empowering. And so ultimately, the greatest resource of all is we're learning how to use more of the brain power of the planet. And with Thank that, with apology, I'm gonna to have to drop off, but it was a pleasure to join you for this. Thank you so very much, Neil, for being part in this fantastic panel. Thank you very much. Okay, Joel, I'll, uh, I'll pass the buck over to you. Where do you think we should be in five years time in regards to 3D printing? Um, technology that's surrounded by agile and adaptive institutions that are inclusive uh, and effective. Okay, and uh, Alan, I'll continue with you. I would argue that we should, like Neil, I like to change the questions. I, I would push it to, to 10 to 15 years, because five years is a little, I think you wanna push just beyond what we can project okay. and let the, the sort of storytellers uh, come in and imagine what could be grounded in the science of where we could go. So I think it should be a little bit further out. And I do think the blending of timeless ancient practices and the joy of making things with advanced technology grounded in community values is that th the synthesis we're looking towards, towards being globally connected, but locally self-sufficient. Great, Angela, I'll continue with you. Oh, I'm moving along my screen here. <laughs> Uh, well, that was a tough one to follow because uh, you um, put, um, or Alan put much better and more eloquently than me, kind of what I wanted to say too, uh, but I will just say that I really hope we see 3D printing and other forms of digital fabrication really realise their revolutionary potential for good things, not bad, the, not the bad parts, but um, really, you know, there to kind of help address uh, climate change issues, sustainability, be genuinely democratized um, and kind of help uh, stimulate and build sustainable local communities which also are globally connected but that is a little bit utopian i think um, we would be looking a little bit more than five years for that but that's what i hope we get probably also a little bit more than 10 years carla that brings me to you sorry this is the most difficult question now uh, you get to answer as last as the last person but what would you say where should we be in five years time time um, so uh, I guess in five years time, um, for, <laughs> I agree with Angela that on the on the longer term vision, uh, and I guess in five years times, um, I would like to see business models um, of 3D printing that are um, sustainable in the material sense, um, it's kind of circular, or using I don't know biodegradable. Uh, uh, elements, but also in the in the way they um, they produce stuff, so so they can lead us eventually to a different understanding of the economy uh, that is not about having a lot of things or rapid access to rapid satisfaction. So being this in five years a stepping stone to a change in the mentality of what it means to be to live good to 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 live and enjoy a, a fulfilling life. Fantastic, what a great closing word. Carla, thank you so much. This dear audience brings us to the end, um, but before we all go, um, I have another important piece of information. If you, dear audience, would like to take part in workshops and engage in discussions, we will share a link in the chat right now where you can uh, sign up to do so. And important disclaimer, you don't have to be a scientist or a researcher to take part in any of this. So the link will be appearing in the chat in just a second. At this time, I would also like to thank my fantastic panel. Here's the link. I'd like to thank my fantastic panel. Thank you for being part in this discussion today. I would like to thank the audience uh, for watching today, spending some time with us. I would like to thank the tech team and also the organizers, the organizing team of the event. Thank you so much for bringing all of us together. I think um, 
we of course didn't answer all the questions. There's so many more questions, but I think we've uh, just taken the conversation a little bit further. So thank you so much for being part in all of this. I hope you have a fantastic evening and um, yeah, see, see you at the other end of COVID, I would hope. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.